Welcome to the Bible Seminary Podcast. We're excited to be talking to our provost, Dr. Scott Stripling, today about the possibilities for doctoral studies here at the Bible Seminary and what it looks like for our students who are currently in master's degree programs to be pursuing doctoral studies in the future. So join with me in welcoming Dr. Scott Stripling. Thank you, Dr. Steinmetz. Hey, thanks for uh, initiating this conversation. I am looking forward to it. I'm excited about the prospect of us developing doctoral programs, but first I want to talk about what we're already doing in terms Mm. of preparing our students for doctoral studies. Uh, How do we, in our master's degree programs, prepare students to go on to success in doctoral degree programs? Mm. It's a great uh, question. First of all, let me just brag on our students a little bit. (laughs) We have 14% of our graduates have gone on to do doctoral programs. That's awesome. Two have completed them, three are currently uh, in those programs. And so our strategy has been to initiate a capstone program, right. which is summative in some sense. But for those who are wanting to do doctoral work, we really almost insist that they do a writing project, a, a thesis. A massive research paper, yeah. That's right, which is going to be somewhere in the area of 50, 60 pages that's going to prepare them to do that research writing that they're going to need to do at the next level. Right, and that's not all of our students. Many of our students go into ministry fields, church, home, community things, but we do have a percentage of students who are looking toward the academy, looking toward doctoral work. Right. And they may not right now think that they're going to do that, but none of us know the future. So we don't want to scare anyone by saying you you have to write this thesis, but we want to encourage them because we're going to do it with them. And so like, if you're supervising a capstone project, a writing project, or if I am, we're literally doing it with them step by step. And they're, they're giving us drafts, and we're on a daily, weekly basis doing that. That's how you learn. Yes. Um, it's not just that we're going to mark it all up at the end and say, right. here's what you did wrong. <laughs> but also the process of getting to know our students through their academic journey mm. so that by the time they reach their capstone, we know whether they should be writing a major research paper mm-hmm. or doing some other kind of project. Uh, because many times our students don't know on day one whether they ever think they'll go on to doctoral work. Sometimes they're surprised by the end of a three or four year degree program to say, I am going to go on and do four or five, six more years and earn a PhD or a doctor of ministry. Yeah, and you know, there's a lot of different type of doctoral degrees. Yes. <laughs> uh, and you can kind of help me think these through, but like there's a Juris Doctorate. There's yeah. a, a doc- medical doctor, which is what always comes to mind. Right. Um, you have um, like Doctor of Engineering. You have yeah. Doctor of Education. A doctoral degree is just a terminal degree, the, the yeah. highest degree you can earn in any field. Think of it as a medical doctor versus a PhD in medicine. If you go Mm. earn a professional degree in medicine, you're a medical doctor, and people come to you for care, treatment Mm. in a clinic or a hospital setting. But if you want to research, write, teach in the academy about medicine, you probably go get your PhD in medicine, not your medical doctorate. And in our field, there's crossover. I have a doctor of ministry. I'm teaching in a seminary. You have a PhD in archaeology. You're teaching in a seminary and doing archaeological field work. So there is overlap. But as a general career path, mm. the doctor of ministry is the professional degree for the field work. Right. The PhD is the academic degree for the research, writing, and teaching. Right. And, and of course, I also have a DMIN. Right. And so y- y- that's sort of that practical, yeah. hands-on um, tactician, if you will. You think about things like you've had experience as a chaplain. Yeah. We've both been pastors. And so you bring these experiences to bear and you're wanting to really demonstrate excellence within that field and also to have have gravitas because yeah. when people are looking to hire you, for example, when we have an opening here at the Bible Seminary, which is not very often, we'll have 100 applicants yeah. for, for that <laughs> position. And so really, somebody really wants to be able to set himself or herself apart. Because we're not just teaching our students information. We are engaged together with them in a process of transformation and growth. And most of our students are going to go on to ministry in the field. Even those who pursue a doctor of ministry or a PhD, right. they're deeply committed to ministering in the church and the world and in their families and their communities. So that mixture of academic rigor and practical experience and application, I think, is just one of the things that sets the right. Bible Seminary apart. One of the things we 
don't want students to think is that they're going to come and sit in class and wait for the pearls of wisdom to fall from the, <laughs> right. the sage's lips. We, we, we are experts in our field, but we want to partner with them yes. in that learning process. Absolutely. Uh, we had a student who was uh, about to start a doctoral program, and he came and sat in my office. He said, I'm scared. You know, yeah. can, can I do this? And I said, you, what you have done these last three years studying with me mm. um, has prepared you. You will excel in your doctoral program. And he, he is. Yes. And that's a really cool overlap between preparing for rigorous PhD studies and preparing for field ministry is that personal connection with your professor, mm -hmm. that, that collaborative learning approach, because that's going to serve you well, whether you end up in a PhD program or end up on a local church board or <laughs> as a foreign missionary, whatever it is you end up doing, yeah. that collaborative approach is really valuable. Yeah, it really is. And that's something that people are looking for inside the academy, outside the academy. Yeah. Uh, another marker is that we involve them in peer-reviewed publications. Yes. And so as they get closer to the end of their master's program with us, we do a joint writing project with the student. Yeah. And so by the time he or she graduates, they've already had that experience, uh, the frustrations of it and yeah. the exhilaration <laughs> of it, to say, here's what a peer-reviewed journal looks like, a peer-reviewed process looks like. And that gives them a lot of confidence. Oh, yeah. And that's very exciting for them to have that opportunity in that setting as a graduate student to present at an academic conference, to publish in a re reviewed journal. Uh, that's really, really cool opportunity for them. That's awesome. Now, I'm sitting here reading your mind, and I know one of the questions you, you want to <laughs> ask me is a scary thing. One of the questions you want to ask me is um, if a lot of theological schools are closing, and we have had you know, uh, quite a few, Nyack College, the most yeah. recent one to announce this, uh, why would the Bible Seminary be expanding? So I assume you want to ask me that, right? That is an excellent question, <laughs> Scott. Thank you so much. I was just thinking that. Well, I'm glad that you... Why are we growing and expanding? I mean, we set, a, we set an enrollment record by yeah. the grace of God this yeah. past term. Uh, we had been growing steadily pre-COVID. We took the COVID dip mm. and have been bouncing back from that and recovering. Mm. And here we are setting an attendance record while, as you said, sadly, many seminaries are closing. So what's going on? Why is that happening? Why do we believe mm. that God is positioning us to grow even more in the, in the years to come? Well, that's right. We feel like God has given us a, a niche, and we, we have a national and an international appeal and audience, and we feel like there are a percentage of students that are expressing that they want to do that final mm. doctoral work with us, Right now, we're do, we're like a finishing school, getting right. them ready <laughs> getting to, them to ready. go on. Yeah. Like Abigail Levitt is doing her PhD at Ariel University uh, in Israel, and I'm actually on her doctoral committee. Right, uh, the the school there asked me to be on her committee, so it's a continued relationship. Yeah. So we tell these guys, we're we're with you for life. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, this isn't just to get you in and get you out, but we're going to partner with you on what God's calling you to do with excellence for the rest sure. of your life. And what we need to do at TBS to make that happen are we need some new facilities. Uh, we need a little elbow room. Yeah. Uh, we've got to have more library space, for example. Absolutely. And whether we decide to go with a DMIN or a PhD, we'll determine both, some things. Or both, Lord willing. <laughs> right. If we do both at the same time, then somebody's going to write a really big check uh, yeah. for us. Um, we need additional library space. We're going to need lab space uh, for, our doctoral, for our doctoral program in archaeology. And uh, we're going to need additional faculty. Yeah. And so we, we, we're talking right now about those things that we need, sort of targeting those faculty, what those library resources yeah. would look like, what those lab resources would look like, so that in a couple of years, or Lord willing, we'll, we'll be here uh, sort of high-fiving and saying, yeah. hey, you know, remember <laughs> when we were talking about it, and now right. we're doing it. Right. So what are, what are the prospects for a student career-wise, ministry-wise, if mm -hmm. they earn a PhD or a doctor of ministry, uh, I'm thinking even though there are many seminaries closing down, there are still many seminaries pumping out graduates with PhDs in biblical or theological studies, with doctor of ministry mm -hmm. degrees. And in some senses, as you said, there's a hundred applications for any opening at the Bible seminary. What are the professional prospects for someone who earns a PhD or a doctor of ministry? And how does the Bible Seminary offer maybe better prospects mm. <laughs> in the way that we envisioning 
envision offering these programs? Well, that's a great question. I, I think a student would, if he or she were wanting to teach in the field of higher education, it's really competitive. Yeah. Um, I think that student would realistically have to go into this thinking, I'm going to do other things, mm. and I'm, I'm seeing this as a long-term career place that I want to be. Um, we give our graduates an opportunity to become teaching assistants, and that's yeah. hugely important. Yeah. And, you know, they get mentored in that process. They get classroom experience. They do those joint writing right. projects. Uh, they teach adjunct at other places so that then they can leverage the relationship. And believe me, it makes a big difference. Yeah. If I call, for example, we're looking to hire someone, and I call, say, Professor uh, Craig Evans, and I say, you know, what can you tell me about this student? And if he tells me he's the best student I've ever had in this right. area, that carries a lot of weight with me. Absolutely. And so we do the same thing for our students. And we're doing that already at the graduate level, so how much right. more so at a doctoral level, that we could really help launch them into a career, whether with us or with a different institution, That's right. upon graduation from a PhD studies, because we're already doing that with our graduate level students. One of the benefits of being small uh, and, and we're still small, uh, relatively speaking, is that we know every student's yeah. name and situation, <laughs> and we care yes. about them. And, and, and we want to help him or her fulfill that life's calling. I'm thinking about Daniel 6.3. It says that Daniel excelled far above his peers, for there was found in him an excellent spirit. Wow. And if we cultivate that excellent spirit, opportunities are going to open yeah. up. God's favor is going to be there. And excellence really sets us apart from others. Yeah, I love that. And that is one of the great benefits of being a smaller school. I'm reflecting back on my own uh, theological education and ministry. When I go to apply for the next degree program, uh, when I go to apply for a position with a church or in a ministry, they need letters of reference, right? And yep. I remember applying for degree programs and I'm scrapping together to come up with two academic references, not because I wasn't a good student, but because my teachers didn't know me because I'm sitting in a class right. with several hundred other students and a teaching assistant is grading my assignments and my professor is not someone I know personally. At TBS, all of our students know all of their professors and vice versa and those letters of recommendation mm. Are, are much more forthcoming and much more genuine and deep because of that connection and that relationship. And I've got to think that's going to be a huge asset to them moving forward. Well, it really is. People hear a lot of information about, you know, I get a graduate degree. Does that impact my income, my yeah. earning capacity? Well, number one, if people are going into ministry, that's not their primary way of thinking. But one does it's need a to make a living and one does think about, yeah. you know, long term, I'm preparing for retirement and what that's going to look like and so forth. Uh, so what's happening trend-wise in America? Think about um, the average with bachelor's degrees has now risen to about 37% of, of Americans 25 and over have a bachelor's degree. And in spite of what you hear out there that that doesn't increase income earning potential and there's trends, well, to some extent, that's true. There's a lot of ways people can make a living without right. having a, a college degree, like electricians and plumbers, sure. for example. <laughs> we need excellent electricians and plumbers, and they'll and be. And they're making more than me. <laughs> and they'll, they'll make. And if they <laughs> right. open their own business, they've got tremendous. Yeah. If they feel like that's what God's calling them right. to do, but there are other people who who feel like God's not calling them to wire things and plumb things. Um, so that's about thirty-seven percent right now. Of that thirty-seven percent, about fourteen percent are people who go on to get master's degrees. So we let's say that 14% of the U.S. population approximately, and this has risen over the last few years, right. um, have master's degrees and others professional certifications like right. CPAs and things like that. And then it really gets narrow when you start talking about <laughs> doctoral programs. So yeah. you've got about 1.5%. Um, and of those who enter doctoral programs, of course, the majority don't finish those right. programs. Right. Wow. So archaeology is your field. It's not mine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, does the picture in terms of career prospects look different in archaeology <clears throat> than from some of these other you know, biblical theological ministry fields? 
I would say there are more opportunities probably in, in biblical archaeology because these students who are coming through, they're not only students, they're also part of my team. Yeah. And so sort of if, I'm, if I may quote Henry V, um, <laughs> Why not? when else would you get a chance to quote Henry V? Um, he who sheds his blood with me today, he will be my brother. And so mm. these people who go into the field with me, um, it's like I put them in harm's way. And they, they expend themselves. And there's a shared suffering and a shared reward that comes from that. And then each according to his gift. You know, yeah. those who excel, those who have zeal for, for this work, I will do everything in my power to open doors for them. Absolutely. And uh, I mentioned Abigail earlier. She's now the assistant director of our excavation, which happens to be the largest excavation in the world. Yeah. And it's because she's demonstrated excellence, she's been faithful over time, and she can do anything yeah. she wants in the future. Jordan and Gary are now doing PhD programs, um, and same thing for them and yeah. uh, all these other guys in, in the field. So I would say the benefit that they have is that it's a smaller world, right. and that we're willing to leverage our, our credibility for them. Um, in a way that I'm really confident will open up doors. Yeah. Yeah. So bear with me here. I'm going to lead the witness a little bit, okay? okay? So I know where I'm going. You probably don't. You quoted Henry V, okay? <laughs> okay. Why did you quote Henry V? What's in your background <clears throat> that causes you to be sitting on a Shakespeare quote? <laughs> right. Why is that floating, <laughs> Why is that floating, floating around in, in my head? head? So I do have a master's in English uh, literature. And so my, my path was uh, interesting. But I took a master's from University of Texas in English literature and then a, a master's from the Simsagat Theological Seminary, a, a typical seminary degree. Interestingly, you know, as you grow a little bit, you get a little bit older, you see how these disparate, seeming disparate threads are really part of a tapestry of God's plan. And so um, being an archaeologist, being a provost, uh, writing is a big part of that, uh, of what I do and helping others. Uh, right well. So it was a, just an interesting career path. But yeah, 1840 to 1870 is my specialty, which is of course not Shakespeare, but uh, you're talking Emerson, Twain, Poe, Hawthorne, Melville. and The so golden forth. era of American Golden age literature. of American literature. Yeah. I was just in Baltimore the last uh, few days and, you know, looking at uh, Poe's old stomping grounds there. <laughs> yeah. you know. So you've, in responding, you've already anticipated my point, and that is education is never wasted. Yeah. Not if we're not if we're faithfully following God and saying, God, here's everything you brought me through. Use me for your mm. purposes. Education can be wasted on those who don't have a purpose in life, who don't follow God's lead. But for those of us who are followers of Christ and who are committed to doing what God has right. for us, education is never wasted. So here you have this master's degree in English. You're a biblical archaeologist, yeah, <laughs> and thought, yet right. you're using it day in and day out. Right. And so my encouragement, I guess, for students is just because you don't know what God might do with that degree down the yeah. road, it is never wasted. Uh, you might start one degree program and finish another. You might you know, audit a few classes, but that's never wasted. That learning and development is never wasted. God yeah. is going to take that and, as you said, weave that tapestry of your life together in ways that you can't anticipate. Let, let's say most of our listeners attend church. Um, do you want to listen to someone on a weekly basis <laughs> who has this rich uh, human, humanistic background? I don't mean in a negative sense. Right. But in the, the best sense this, of humanism. Yeah. And the, uh, the liberal humanism. arts yeah. back, background who, who speaks and uses illustrations that cause you to think about things you wouldn't have otherwise thought about, stretches you in, in different ways. I do. Yeah. And so this a liberal arts education, while I hear a lot of people being negative about that, if someone's going into ministry, this is a tremendous, or nonprofit leadership sure. or anything like this, later in life, people are going to be doing a lot of public speaking and they never dreamed that they would be. They're going to be leading boards and right. doing things. <laughs> and to be able to draw upon this well, and this is what I often tell ministry candidates, is, is keep your reservoir full. Yeah. And if you keep your reservoir full, you're ready at a moment's notice yeah. to, to share, to speak, to impart. Um, so Because you're pouring out all the time. you got to be pouring in. I was reading, I forget what book it was, I was reading recently, and there was a quotation about how the, the ministry of preaching mm. might require expertise in more fields than any other task. 
and you start to think about it, to, to get up and preach the Word of God, it's not just Scripture. It's right. culture. It's history. It's ethics. It's philosophy. Yeah. It's science. It's, I mean, the, the breadth of knowledge that's expected of a typical pastor, a typical preacher, mm. even a typical Sunday school teacher or small group leader, when you open that book <laughs> and teach, the more resources you can bring to bear on understanding and applying God's word, yeah. the better off you and all the people that you're interacting with are. Think about just the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus went up into a mountain, he sat down, he saw the multitude, and there he taught them. You've got all those things there. Yeah. I mean, what is a mountain? <laughs> right. you know, geology, like how is this formed? And um, he sat down, how do the muscles work? Right. Um, he saw them. You know, how's the eye working? And there was a multitude. Well, there were 5,000 men and the average man had a family. That, right. you know, how do you do the math on yeah. this? So, I mean, literally, you could do a whole curriculum from Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Right. Well, Scott, this has been awesome. I really appreciate you taking the time today to talk through some of these things. It's exciting to think about the future, not yeah. only for our students who are already pursuing doctoral work elsewhere, but for what we might offer to students right here at the Bible Seminary in terms of PhD and doctorate ministry programs. So what can people do to invest in the work that TBS is doing to help us in this mission and help us realize this dream of expanding our offerings to doctoral programs? Thanks for asking that question. Um, we, we really need people to come along with financial resources and say, think about legacy giving, for example. Mm -hmm. Like, what, what is my legacy going to look like as I'm thinking about transferring whatever wealth I've been able to accumulate in my lifetime, and my wife and I are not going to be around 20 years from now right. or 10 years from now or whatever. What's, what does that look like? How do, yeah. we, how do we leverage that for maximum mm -hmm. impact on the kingdom of God? And and I'm suggesting that the Bible Seminary is an excellent way to do that, to, to yes. invest into the future. And in order for us to do these doctoral programs, we're going to need some lead gifts. We're going to need people helping us get the facilities that we're going to need, the faculty right. that we're going to need. I think we've been faithful with little. And Jesus said if we do that, yeah. he'll trust us with much. Yeah. And so that's our prayer. And we are just so grateful for our TBS family that have helped us to get to this point, And we know the Lord will raise up others to help us take the next step. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Been my pleasure. Appreciate you joining us. Amen. Mm -hmm.